Some watching this service this morning are old enough to remember when Sunday was a very different day from what it is today. There were no shops or shopping centers open on a Sunday at any time. There were few cars on the roads except on a Sunday morning taking people to their place of worship. There was little organized sport taking place. And in many homes, including the home that I was brought up in, there was no homework or schoolwork done on a Sunday. But how things have changed. Today, many shops and shopping centers are open every Sunday afternoon. Sunday is like any other day on our roads and motorways. Sport abounds both on the playing fields and on television. And there must be few homes now where school children do not do homework or schoolwork on a Sunday. In other words, Sunday's like any other day of the week. And this has all happened gradually over a period of time. When I was a lot younger, there was talk of the danger of this country adopting a continental Sunday. But now some of the countries on the European continent have stricter regulations on Sunday than are present here. In Jesus' day, the Sabbath was simply part of the way of life of the Orthodox Jew. It was a day that God had instituted from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it was a creation ordinance, similar to work and marriage. And it stood as a reminder to God's people that He was the God of salvation as well as creation, because he'd rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15. Now, the problem that Jesus faced during his earthly ministry was that the Sabbath, or the seventh day of every week, had become the platform for showcasing Pharisaic legalism and works righteousness. In fact, what God established as a day of reverence toward Him and renewal and refreshment away from work, the scribes and the Pharisees had turned into a stifling day of regulation and restriction. The word Sabbath in the Old Testament is to derived from the Hebrew word meaning to rest or desist. So God's people were to refrain from unnecessary work in order to focus their attention on honoring and worshiping him. But over the 15 centuries, from the time of Moses to the ministry of Jesus, the Sabbath accumulated a vast number of additional rabbinic rules and regulations and restrictions. And they made this day, this special holy day, an overpowering burden. In fact, no area of life was spared from the fastidious Sabbath regulations of the rabbis. Let me give you some examples. There were laws about drinking milk, eating honey, spitting on the ground, writing and getting dirt off clothes. Anything that was contrived as unnecessary work was forbidden on the Sabbath. Therefore, scribes couldn't carry their pens, tailors couldn't use their needles, and student, students couldn't read their books. What is more, no insect could be killed on the Sabbath. No candle or flame could be lit. Nothing could be bought or sold. No bathing was allowed for the simple reason that water might spill onto the floor and accidentally wash it. An egg could not be boiled. No furniture could be moved inside a home, for it might create ruts on the floor and so constitute plowing. No mature woman was allowed to look in the mirror since she might be tempted to pull out any gray hair she spotted. And this was viewed as work. A person was not allowed to travel more than 3,000 feet from home. That's around 914 meters. This was the kind of Sabbath that Jesus encountered among the, the people of his day. And such man-made traditions which were perpetuated by the scribes and the Pharisees, placed a crushing burden on the people 
who were bowed down by the stifling regulations. This was in total contrast to the transforming power of the Lord Jesus, because the Lord Jesus offered freedom, freedom and refreshment to those who trusted and followed Him. And He brought liberation to those who were under the burden of an oppressive and Sabbatarian legalism from which they could get no relief. In the passage we read for us, or that was read for us earlier, earlier, the Lord Jesus directly challenged the Pharisees and their false understanding of the Sabbath. Let's look at this passage together, and if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. The first thing I want us to notice here is the context, verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. Now, the setting here is an event that takes place on a particular Sabbath, verse 23a. Jesus and his disciples were walking through the fields where grain was growing. And as Jesus was passing through the grain fields, some of his disciples, as they walked along, picked heads of grain, verse 23b. According to Luke's account, Luke 6 and 1, they rubbed the bits of grain in their hands and ate them. Why did they do this? Matthew 12 and 1 gives us the reason they were hungry. Now, in the ancient world, it was normal for pathways to crisscross fields, and it was easy for travelers to traverse through the crops, passing fields where crops were being grown. And as they walked alongside the crops, it was common for these travelers to pluck a few heads of grain. Now, according to Deuteronomy 23 and 25, such a practice was permissible. So, Jesus' type's disciples were doing what the Old Testament permitted them to do. When they picked off the heads of grain and rubbed the heads in their hands to remove the husk or shell and ate the kernel, their actions were perfectly allowable within the purposes of God. But, and it is a big but, not so in the minds of these orthodox religious leaders and theologians. You see, these people who spoke to Jesus and confronted him were blind to the grace of God, despite claiming obedience to the very law of God. That's the picture we have of these men, not only in this passage, but in many other passages throughout the gospel. Maybe I'm repeating what I said a few weeks ago, but it's quite possible to be schooled and even trained in the Word of God, yet to be totally blind to its transforming power. I've been reading recently the story, the famous story of the two brothers, John and Charles Wesley. Both these men had been brought up in a Christian home, not just a Christian home, a clergyman's home. They had both been called into the holy orders of the Anglican ministry. For a number of years, both of them exercised their ministries within the Anglican communion. Yet remarkably, both these men knew nothing of the saving grace of God. They knew nothing of assurance of God's salvation and forgiveness of sins until one day, one week in May 1738, Within days of one another, both were converted. Charles, the great hymn writer, was converted through a nurse in his home. And John, the great preacher, through the reading of Luther's preface to the Romans. You see, here were two men who were schooled. Schooled in the Scripture, schooled in the Word of God, but until then they knew nothing of the grace of God. Here in Mark chapter 2 are these Pharisees, and they knew all about the law. They knew all about the Word of God, but they didn't know the God of the Word. That's the context. And then secondly, notice the criticism, verse 25, verse 24. The Pharisees said to him, that is Jesus, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. 
Now, the Pharisees' complaint here obviously concerned the action of the disciples plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath day. They interpreted this action of plucking grain as reaping, which in their view was an act of work. And according to their interpretation, it was in violation of the Sabbath rest. Now, it is correct to note that reaping on the Sabbath was formally prohibited by the Mosaic law, Exodus 34, 20, 21. And among the scribes, it was assumed that a teacher was responsible for the behavior of his disciples. And so, for this reason, the Pharisees addressed their protest directly to Jesus. You'll notice that. The Pharisees said to him, not the disciples, to Jesus, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, let's look, before we come to Jesus' response, let's look at the nature of their complaint. There were essentially two problems with it. Number one is this. These theologians, these experts in the law of God, were concerned purely with external legalism. They were not concerned about the hunger or the well-being of Jesus' disciples. Their only interest was in fault-finding and protecting the petty and, in some cases, man-made regulations that comprise their system of external religion. Now, how do we apply this to ourselves today? Let me say this. We too can be guilty of the same sin. When we regard some things done in the home on Sunday as permissible, but as wrong if done outside the home where people might see, we're more interested in external legalism than anything else. And that's a great danger in the church today. Here's the second reason why it was wrong. Their heart attitude was all wrong. What lay behind their criticism were hearts that were set against the Lord Jesus. They were antagonistic to Jesus. This this note goes continually through Mark's gospel. And because Jesus and his followers lived a life that was in complete contrast to their system of regulative religion, these men opposed. Jesus and his followers. And it was in the last resort, the jealousy of these theologians of Israel that drove Jesus to death. None were so blind as those who could not see, those who boasted in their own theological insights. Do you remember Jesus' words in Matthew 23 and 13? This is what he said to these people. Woe to you, teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. In other words, you yourselves are not in the kingdom of God, but you're preventing others from getting into the kingdom of God. How salient is that? Are we, by our attitudes and actions, keeping others away from Jesus and outside his kingdom? That, secondly, is the criticism. And then, thirdly, the counter-question. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus makes use of a counter-question that extends to the end of verse 26 and includes an appeal to Scripture in order to settle the controversy. Notice what Jesus says in verse 25. He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? The Scripture reference that Jesus refers to here comes from the the desert fox years of David's life, as one commentator has put them. When David and his companions were on the run from Saul, who sought David's life, what happens? In 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 6, we read that in hunger and desperation and without proper provisions, David enters the house of God, the tabernacle, in search of food. 
Now notice what it says in verse 26. In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Now you picture the scene. David and his men are exhausted. They haven't had food for hours, maybe longer than that. And here they find refuge in the tabernacle. They discover that there are 12 loaves of consecrated bread that were placed on the altar Sabbath by Sabbath as food for the priests. What are they to do? Well, 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 6 tells us that the high priest showed compassion to David and his men. He allowed them to eat the consecrated bread. He made an exception because of their great need. Now, isn't it interesting that God did not punish either the high priest or David for their actions, but allowed a ceremonial law to be set aside for the sake of meeting an urgent need? Note that the weight of Jesus' argument here rests not, not so much on the priest, but on David, verse 26b. It was David who entered the house of God, David who ate the consecrated bread, and David who gave some also to his companions. Now, why is that significant? Well, can I tell you who David was? David was not only Israel's greatest king, David was the precursor of the Messiah, born in the line of Judah. And what Jesus is saying there is if it was permissible for David to set aside ceremonial law to make a particular need, it was surely permissible for the Lord Jesus, the one who is both the Son of God and the Messiah, to set aside rabbinic tradition to allow the needs of his disciples to be met. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here in verses 25 and 26. Let me summarize it in one sentence. Showing compassion and mercy always trump strict adherence to religious and ceremonial law. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, how do we apply this in the 21st century? Well, there will be occasions on Sunday, God's day that He's set aside for worship and rest that we will be called on to exercise works of mercy and works of necessity in order to alleviate a particular need. Now, as in David's day, these will be exceptions. They'll not be the normal course of things, but when, we arise, when they arise, we are always to act with compassion and love and grace rather than adhering to the strict letter of the law. That's what Jesus is saying here. I stress that it is the exception. It's not the normal course of things. But when it occurs, we are to do what David did in 1 Samuel 21. And we're to do what Jesus did. Notice thirdly, the claims, or finally, sorry, the claims that Jesus makes. The claim that Jesus makes. Verses 27 and 28, Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. You notice in conclusion that Jesus makes two very important claims. Number one is the fundamental principle that the Sabbath was made for man and not vice versa. Now, what is Jesus saying here? What does he mean? He means this, that you and I were not made for Sabbath rules and regulations, but the Sabbath was given to us by God in order to bless us and to enhance our well-being and not to burden us. So, God has given us one day rest and seven for our benefit, for our good, not as a burden to lay upon us. As um, Gemma said in her children's talk, if God rested from work on this day, so should we. 
And I believe my parents were right in bringing my sister and I up to take rest from schoolwork on Sunday. Those who drive themselves on seven days in the week, who ignore God's institution, who dis- that what they do, in fact, is distort the order of life as God intended it to be. And if you're a Christian this morning, you need to resist the pressures of modern society to make Sunday the same as any other day. And that's what Jesus is saying. On the other hand, Jesus is also saying here that the Sabbath day is not to be an intolerable burden on our shoulders. It's not to be hedged about with all kinds of restrictions and petty regulations, which in some cases may well be regulations that we make up, which is what the Pharisees had done. They had forgotten God's merciful provision for His people. The Sabbath was given to meet our needs and to bring a special blessing, not to restrict our lives and reduce us to rule-keeping robots. That's the first claim, the principle. Secondly, the power, the authoritative power that lay behind the Sabbath. Let's see how this passage concludes. Verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus answers here the question the Pharisees must have been asking as he redefined the Sabbath convention for them. This is the question they probably were asking, by what authority do you presume to do this? And here is Jesus' crystal clear reply. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other words, lordship of the Sabbath is invested in Jesus Christ. The word for Lord here appears at the beginning of the sentence in Greek, and it's emphatic. We could translate it like this. Who is Lord of the Sabbath? The Son of Man is. You see, God had instituted the Sabbath, Genesis 2 verse 3, and Jesus now presumes preeminence over it. Verse 27 is the principle that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And it is so because the Son of Man, verse 28, is Lord. So Jesus' authority as the Son of Man extends over the Sabbath itself. He claims to have absolute right over the Sabbath day because of His person and work. That's God's Son and God in the flesh. Now, what does that mean for us today as I close? What does it mean for you and me in the 21st century? Well, it means first and foremost that it is in submission to His Lordship that you and I will find the blessing of Sunday. As we learn to love the Lord, as we learn to walk with Him, we will know how best to use this special day to honor Him to witness to others, and to realize what pleases Him comes first. It's a good question that was asked many years ago, and there used to be a little lapel, uh, a little badge or lapel that people wore, and it was this, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? WWJD. And that's a good maxim for how we spend Sunday. What would Jesus do? Because He is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Let me finish with this poem written many years ago by Arthur Pink. A Sabbath well spent brings a week of content and strength for the toil of tomorrow, but a Sabbath for famed Whatever may be gained is a certain forerunner of sorrow. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you've given us this very special day to worship you and to rest. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, whose preeminence over the Sabbath, that he is Lord of this day.
And we pray that we might live in fellowship and relationship with you, knowing Jesus Christ, and that we might honor him on this day, that we might do what he would want us to do. Forgive us if we've been caught up with petty, petty regulations and restrictions. But we ask that we, above everything else, might be men and women and young people who live in the freedom of fellowship with the living God and that people seeing the way that we spend Sunday, that they might say there's something different about them. And we ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen. We're now going to sing our final hymn, which has a verse about the Sabbath. O Sabbath rest by Galilee. The hymn is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, and we worship God together.